Thank you, Michael. I can't tell you what pleasure it is to see this wonderful turnout tonight at a Pell Center lecture. Um, the Pell Center, as you know, um, was begun over 10 years ago, and it was really started in an effort to carry forward Senator Pell's ideals and values, and they correspond absolutely to Salve Regina's ideals and values. Um, I often speak about the mission of Salve Regina, but there really are only three words that anybody ever remembers from that mission. And that is that we hope that after they graduate and while they are here, our students will work for a world that is harmonious, just, and merciful. Harmonious, just, and merciful. Those were Senator Tell, um, Pell's values, they're also ours. And the lectures that we have and the studies that we do and the scholars that we invite will all have that in mind. How can we create that kind of world? Um, that's what we're doing here tonight. I think we're very fortunate tonight in terms of what is happening in history and what is happening with our speaker. He will be introduced to you later, but you'll see that this is a wonderful moment, I think, for our world, and it's one that we need to reflect on deeply. And so we begin that reflection tonight listening to our speaker, and then with all the dialogue that comes after it. So welcome, welcome members of the Newport community, a special welcome to our students and to our faculty. This is what it means to be a university. We're happy to be here and we're happy to have you here. I'd like now to introduce uh, Dr. Khalil Habib, who will then introduce our speaker, Khalil. Good evening, everybody. I'm going to keep this short. Um, I'm just excited to hear our speaker this evening, as I'm sure you are, who was the third in a series of lectures this year on the Middle East and uh, hosted and sponsored by the Pell Center. Uh, Thanasis Kambanis covered the region of the Middle East. Um, bureau, sorry. Kambanis covered the region as Middle East Bureau Chief for the Boston Globe with a particular focus on the Lebanon War and its aftermath. Since 2007, Kambanis has reported from the Middle East for the New York Times and other publications. He teaches journalism and foreign policy at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and a new school in New York City where he lives with his family. His first book, which is available outside and in the lobby, is entitled A Privilege to Die Inside Hezbollah's Legions and Their Endless War Against Israel and examines how Hezbollah's widespread popularity rests on its ability to offer its followers economic reform affordable health care, dependable electricity, efficient ports, and safe streets, as well as victory over Israel. I'm not sure it's in that order, but um, also unique to the party is its powerful doctrine of self-improvement, which challenges its members to fight ignorance and poverty. With its promise of perpetual war, Hezbollah has become what the author describes as, quote, the most dynamic force in the Middle East, ushering in a militant resistance and inspiring fighters in Gaza, the West Bank, Egypt, Iraq, and beyond. Whatever their differences, their hatred of Israel and the United States bind them together. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Professor Kambanis. Thank you, Khalil, and thank, uh, thanks all of you for coming tonight, and thanks to the uh, many wonderful people who put this event together. It's a real privilege to be here, uh, and it's particularly fun for me because I just got back from Egypt uh, three days ago, two and a half days ago, so I'm processing a whole new set of uh, really exciting uh, and, and to, me, to, to my view, really inspiring events uh, that are forcing me to reshape and rethink a lot of my ideas and, and thoughts. So I'm not going to give you the, the talk that I thought I was going to give you a month, a month and a half ago uh, when we were setting the details of this, and, and I sort of chuckled when you uh, read, read uh, uh, that introduction, which, you know, citing my often repeated point that Hezbollah represents the most dynamic force in the Middle East. I'm happy to say uh, today that, that uh, there's another equally dynamic force in, in the Middle East uh, that we're seeing in Egypt. Uh, we saw it in Tunisia. We, we saw it this morning in Bahrain. Uh, that, that's a, a second and alternative uh, center of gravity 
in, in contemporary Middle Eastern politics that uh, uh, is going to give Hezbollah some, uh, possibly is going to give Hezbollah and its axis of resistance uh, some run for its money. Uh, so I'll, I'll get into that uh, uh, in, in, in my remarks. What I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, generally two things. I'm going to talk to you first of all about uh, what Hezbollah is, what makes it tick, and, and, and their sort of uh, triumphant uh, ideology of resistance and the way they made themselves the, up until January, uh, most dynamic uh, force in, in the Middle East. Uh, and then I'm going to talk uh, for about the, the second half of my remarks about the Egyptian Revolution, uh, or I don't know what we're going to call this, but the sort of Arab Spring or the uh, uh, the, the youth movement, the youth revolt, the, 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 the sort of radical and exciting uh, new wave of, of, of uh, activism that's coursing through the, the Arab and Islamic world right now as we speak. And then I'm going to try and tie that together at the end uh, by asking some questions about where this might lead uh, for, for the Arab world, where it might lead for American policy, uh, and really what, uh, what's at stake in this war of ideas uh, that's, that's playing itself out uh, right now on the, on the streets and in the halls of power uh, uh, throughout uh, this, this region that seems to constantly come back into our, our, our attention and into the news. My introduction to the Middle East uh, was not... Uh, not the usual one. Right? Most most people I know got into the uh, uh, started following the conflict, following the region through the prism of the Arab-Israeli conflict from, from one side or another. Uh, I came at it uh, from from the vantage point of the invasion of Iraq, and my introduction to working in the Arab world was you know, camping on on the streets of southern Iraq as an unembedded reporter, uh, trying to cover the lives of ordinary Iraqis. Uh, rebuilding, or first of all, living under the during the war, and then rebuilding after the invasion. Again and again, uh, first in Iraq, and then later uh, as I traveled throughout the region, uh, this this idea uh, kept coming up in in, in the oddest quarters. Uh, and and it was people, whether you know, uh, Sadrists, Shiites in, in eastern Baghdad, uh, Sunni activists, secular folks in, in Syria, in Iraq, in the West Bank later, in Gaza, uh, even in Egypt, were, were again and again bringing up to me in, in the early part of the, of the last decade, in the middle of the last decade, uh, were bringing up to me again and again this idea that they wanted to, to emulate the model of Hezbollah. They were activists who were trying to do some kind of uh, often secular reformist project, sometimes a, a militant religious project, uh, in societies far afield from Lebanon. And the model they kept citing was Hassan Nasrallah's Hezbollah. Now, I hadn't given a whole lot of thought to Hezbollah uh, in the contemporary era. I had, a, I had an image that was fairly uh, solidified from, from Hezbollah's activities of the 80s, the, the <coughs> Marine barracks bombing, uh, the blowing up of the U.S. Embassy, the kidnappings of Westerners, uh, and uh, you know, 2003, Hezbollah wasn't really at the forefront of my mind. Uh, and uh, as I as I realized that uh, a whole array of, of people around the Middle East, including Christians and secular people and, and, and atheists and, and leftists, were modeling their political activism and their approach to mobilization on Hezbollah. Uh, really kindled my curiosity, and it made me want to find out what it was uh, that Hezbollah had put together, and what was the idea, uh, Hezbollah's idea, that had managed to animate so much uh, of the Arab world. Uh, and I got my chance, uh, as, as uh, people in my line of work are want to, uh, when war broke out in 2006 between Israel and, uh, and Lebanon. I hopped on the first plane to Damascus because the airport in Lebanon had been bombed, and I took a taxi down to Beirut. And my my primary goal was to find Hezbollah uh, and talk to as many people in Hezbollah as I could to really learn what it was that made them tick, what they stood for, what what they were trying to build. Uh, I had a very sophisticated plan. My, my plan of attack was uh, to get as close to the Israeli border as I could and look for guys with beards and cargo pants. <laughs> and uh, I realized it was a bad plan when no one in Lebanon wanted to work with me. 
uh, I couldn't find a driver, I couldn't find a translator, no one wanted to go near this, this, this approach. Eventually, I rented my own car, I found a, an American colleague uh, from another newspaper who spoke Arabic, and we, we, headed, uh, we headed south. And we just started poking around in morgues, and mosques, and cemeteries, uh, and, and uh, asking for uh, Hezbollah people, without much luck initially. Uh, it, it's, it's not really the most discreet thing to do in the middle of a war, to sort of trace around and you know, go up to people and say, hey, are you in Hezbollah? Uh, but we finally had our, our, our breakthrough about halfway through the war, the last day of July 2006, and we went to the town of Bin Jabail. Uh, you might have heard of Bin Jabail, that's the town where Mahmoud Ahmadinejad gave his speech in, I think it was September now, uh, just this past fall, when he came to Lebanon and sort of gave a, a railing speech uh, directed towards Israel, that was in the town of Bin Jabail. And this, this town is, is a really important symbol uh, for both sides of that conflict. For Hezbollah, it's the capital of the Islamic resistance. This is a, a, a village that has been destroyed and rebuilt countless times. It's a place where uh, most neutral denizens have, have fled over the decades, and the people who remain are true, uh, uh, dyed-in-the-wool, uh, committed, dedicated partisans of what they call the Society of Islamic Resistance. Uh, they, are, they are passionate believers. Uh, they're either members of Hezbollah or, or active supporters. They're trustworthy loyalists. And they've built uh, a society that's, uh, that's supposed to be the, the paragon of, of what Hezbollah uh, is trying to do uh, in Lebanon and in the wider Arab world. Uh, they, they take pride in, in how they've uh, sort of brought on the, 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 the worst Israel has to offer and rebuilt again and again, uh, and a sort of perverse pleasure in, in their ability to rebound. Uh, for Israel, Bidjabel symbolizes the, the, that very pernicious persistence of Hezbollah. Uh, it's, a, it's a place they've tried to, uh, to, to route Hezbollah out of time and again, and they failed to do so, and it... And it it symbolizes the frustration of, uh, of what they're, they're trying to accomplish. So on July 31st, uh, 2006, when, when I got to Vinci Bale, uh, I knew this was a place that Hezbollah had made uh, a significant part of their stand, and, uh, and I went wandering through a, an unbelievable, uh, desolate landscape of, of destruction. I mean, this was a town where you could only recognize the streets because the rubble was a foot deep instead of six feet deep. Uh, the entire commercial district had been leveled uh, with artillery, uh, and this was halfway through the war, it got a lot worse by the end. By afternoon, uh, we, we, had, we had sort of been going through the alleys, uh, suddenly as, 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 as the sun was starting to, 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 to go down a little bit, this man strode out from between two piles of rubble, came, came right towards us, uh, and he was definitely Hezbollah. He had the big beard, he had the cargo pants, he had a walkie-talkie chattering, uh, on, his, on, his, on his waist, he, his, his, his hair was full of dust, uh, he definitely looked every bit of fighter, uh, and I was nervous that he wouldn't want to talk to us, that was my, my big fear. He came right up to, right up to me and my friend, uh, and I opened his mouth and said, so, did you get your story? <laughs> In perfect English. Uh, he proceeded to sit down with us on the floor of a half-destroyed mosque, and he spent hours uh, talking to us about his... Uh, his role, his love of Hezbollah, the things uh, that had motivated him to join this movement. And he was, uh, on the one hand, every bit the kind of uh, fanatical, obsessive uh, uh, talker you might expect. Uh, and, at, and at the same time, he surprised me at every turn uh, with, with his story and his level of humanity. Uh, he was a, an upper middle class expat who grew up in Kuwait, went to the best schools, uh, he went uh, to study engineering, and his parents had expected him to follow his father uh, in working for an oil company in the Gulf and making good money and living a nice bourgeois existence in Kuwait. Uh, instead, after college, he moved to Mitchabail to join Hezbollah, uh, because during his, his, his years as a student, he had come uh, to, 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 to believe this ethos of resistance, this uh, uh, this very alluring and, and successful idea that Hezbollah had, uh, uh, ha has managed to construct o over the decades since its founding in, in 1982, uh, he decided he could not live as an Arab man in today's Middle East with dignity unless he joined actively uh, the, the Hezbollah's mission of resistance. 
so he moved into, at the time, occupied southern Lebanon, got married, had his children, uh, and dedicated his life, every, every aspect of his life, I mean, not just fighting uh, when wars were on and training on the weekends, but uh, the rest of the time, uh, he, taught, he taught engineering, he recruited young men uh, into the fighting wings of Hezbollah, he would recruit other people into, into the movement as, uh, as cadres, uh, and he was, he was a funny, charming, uh, warm guy, uh, and you know he would he would just rant for a while about uh, you know how how uh, you know how evil the Israelis are how evil the Americans are how it just disgusted him to think about you know uh, anyone who would who would set foot in America he would he would he would tell us about how his relatives would come for the summer from from Dearborn and he would just harangue them for hours to convince them to emigrate back to South Lebanon and join him uh, and then he would turn around and, and say you know I hope when this war is over you can come and join me and my family for dinner. Uh, you know, it'd be a great pleasure. So he had this mix of of, of fanaticism and, and, and humanity uh, that was unusual, uh, and it certainly wasn't what I expected. He also really uh, exemplified what Hezbollah society is about at its core, uh, and, and it's about something much more than just religious devotion or uh, a war against Israel. It's about an entire system of life. And, and it's a belief system that, that covers everything from, uh, as Ronnie Bazi uh, told me, from, from his Islamic uh, obligation to fight the, the, the war against Israel uh, to his Islamic obligation to uh, engage in what he called the digestive jihad, uh, which was a sort of macrobiotic diet that, that, that he had imposed on his family and which you know, reminded me a lot of what my friends in New York do in sort of, as a sort of cleansing, you know, uh, 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 routines. And uh, uh, he, he, was, he was getting from Hezbollah his ideas about how to be a good husband, how to be a good father, uh, how to be a good neighbor, uh, all the way up to his politics, his view of American foreign policy, uh, uh, you know, what, what the appropriate position to take on Israel was, which in, in this case is that it should not exist. Uh, and he was living and breathing this in every aspect of his life. Uh, and he was doing it with a lot of excitement and happiness. I and mean, he was not a morose uh, uh, man eager, eager to die. He loved his life. He was having a blast. Uh, and, and this uh, was really a, a great introduction to what, uh, what Hezbollah has built. Uh, as, a, as an institution and as a community. The, the men and women like Ronnie Bazi are, are the pillars of Hezbollah's Islamic resistance society. What they've done uh, is create an appealing model of life that people aspire to join. Uh, this, is, this is not a, a movement that, that browbeats people into supporting them. It's a movement that lures them in uh, by making people want to be just like them. And this was, was Ronnie's one of Ronnie's main roles, as I came to learn over the subsequent years, uh, was to be a sort of all-around Mr. Hezbollah in, in, in his community. He was a scout leader, he was a teacher, he was well-loved, and kids wanted to grow up and be just like him. Uh, and by extension, of course, to join Hezbollah if, if, if Hezbollah would have them, uh, and sign up for their whole credo and, 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 and worldview. So he was, he, he's sort of a, a, a paragon of, of, of Hezbollah's activists, but what is, what is Hezbollah as a movement? Well, Hezbollah inside Lebanon is, is a movement that represents and controls about half, half the population, half the political power, uh, if, you, if you interpret this loosely. Uh, and uh, the, the million or so folks who are in Hezbollah's actual community uh, span three levels. So at the center are the, the uh, paid, employed, uh, fully indoctrinated movement activist members like uh, Ronnie Bazi. They fight for the party, they work for the party, they run its, uh, its bureaucracy. Uh, but they number, in, in fact, uh, in the tens of thousands, a very small number. I mean, they, they have maybe 2,000 uh, active men at arms at any one time. That's all they need in order to maintain the guerrilla war against Israel. Uh, and then they have 10-ish thousand full-time party employees who run the party organs. Now that's, that's a tiny sliver of what makes Hezbollah this dynamic engine of, of, uh, in, the, in the war of ideas in, in today's Middle East and Arab world. So 
who are the people that, that, that make Hezbollah into this, into this movement that has really, in my view, uh, done more to set the agenda of, of political thought and, and cultural thought in the Arab world than any other uh, movement? Uh, well, the answer is what I like to call the, the soccer moms of, of Hezbollah. Uh, and that is the uh, middle class, prosperous, well-educated people who choose uh, to become members of Hezbollah's community and are, are completely loyal to its project without being actual members or having any formal uh, relationship to the party of God. Uh, the, the most sort of vivid character I came to know who represents this strain of Hezbollah's community was a, a young woman named Anaya Haider. She was a nurse at the uh, hospital in Tyre uh, where a lot of the wounded from, from the Southern Front were coming during the war. Uh, she was from a, a very uh, enthusiastic Hezbollah supporting family, but she wasn't a member herself. Uh, and she was somewhat atypical in that she was very at ease uh, with foreigners. She liked talking to reporters. She felt like Hezbollah's gospel was just this incredibly alluring thing. And, and the more people who heard it, the more people would like it. So she, was, she wanted to spread the good news about what, what Hezbollah was all about and uh, sort of guilelessly and happily uh, would help anyone, you know, anyone she could and, 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 tell, and tell her story and Hezbollah's story. Uh, when, when she could. So I, I got to know her because I would go to the hospital every morning to find out where the dead people and wounded people were coming from so I could cover the, the progress of the war. Uh, and the first day I walked in, there was Anaya with her waist-length hair uh, and uh, in, her, in the scrubs she wore for 34 days uh, that she was on duty. And uh, she was very warm, very helpful. And uh, uh, her, her story was, was, was really you know, again, surprised me. She was in Beirut when war broke out at, at, at the American University of Beirut Medical Center, and as soon as she heard that the bombing had started, she hitchhiked south uh, against the tide of people fleeing the fighting. Uh, her father was calling on her phone, and she just hit silent because she didn't want him to, she didn't want to pick up and then have to defy him if he told her not to go. Uh, and she got to the hospital, and once she was on duty, she called him up and told him where she was, and spent the next 34 days on duty uh, doing what she viewed as her responsibility and her role as a member of the Society of Resistance, completely unbidden. Nobody asked her to do this. And uh, she was essentially volunteering uh, to help Hezbollah in its war effort because she felt herself a citizen of Hezbollah, not of Lebanon, not of, uh, of some kind of uh, uh, greater Ummah or, or, or you know, pan-Arab community or anything else. Her, her identity was to the resistance community, uh, and she viewed it as her duty to, to, to figure out what that community needed and give it to them if she could. Uh, and she came from a family of, of very high achieving, empowered women, all of them encouraged by their father to study sciences, uh, all of them in the professions, and all of them completely imbued with, uh, with a dedication to Hezbollah society of Islamic resistance. And uh, uh, they, they had no trouble twinning uh, their interests in, uh, in, in advancing themselves and advancing their families with this uh, uh, dedication to, to a, an essentially belligerent and, uh, uh, and, and, and sort of zealous uh, 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 religious militant ideology. Uh, and she, uh, she was, like a lot of people I came to know, uh, really the, the bulwark of, of Hezbollah's community. I mean, these are the people who made Hezbollah's institutions function and thrive. Uh, their admirable health care and, 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 and network schools. Uh, the, the fact that the party uh, has as much money as it has, a, a lot of it stems from people uh, like Anaya's family who work and give a lot of generously uh, from, from the money they earn back to the party of God. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and they have turn it into a movement of the middle class, uh, not, not a movement of religious students or of the disenfranchised, but actually of, 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 of the yuppies and the bourgeoisie and the, the, the upwardly mobile. Uh, the final sort of piece to, to, to what makes up Hezbollah's community is uh, uh, the, the gets it to the sort of million people that, that, that support Hezbollah. Uh, I best understood by, by the man who finally uh, appeared towards the end of the war and said he was willing to work with me and, and, and uh, uh, chase around uh, Hezbollah members in these crazy parts of, of the country that were getting bombed. Uh, he, was, he was referred to me by someone who said he's got no experience, never worked with journalists, but uh, 
Uh, he's fearless and he speaks great English. So I went to meet him, his name was Durgam Durgam, and we sat down and he started talking to me in this really heavy southern accent. Uh, I said, Durgam, where did you learn your, your English? I said, you want to know the truth? I said, sure, the, the truth, the truth would be good. Uh, and he said, I used to deal drugs in Atlanta. Uh, proceeds to tell me this whole long story about how, you know, at the beginning of the Civil War, he was fighting with one of the Shia militias, getting into too much trouble, his parents sent him to America so that he would uh, you know, have a better life. Uh, he had what he thought was a better life, which was the life of a mid-level uh, uh, drug uh, uh, runner. Uh, he loved it. He loved uh, his life in Atlanta. His fondest memories were of the strip clubs. Uh, he married, had two kids, eventually got arrested and deported, sent back to Lebanon. Uh, and his, while he was away, his brothers had become very pious and had, had moved from the Amal militia to Hezbollah, and they had become non-drinking, uh, you know, responsible, serious Islamic militants. Durkheim thought they were ridiculous. You know, he, was, he would make fun of them right and left. You know, these, these guys, they take themselves so seriously, they're total buffoons, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're always coming around telling me not to drink. Uh, you know, he found, he found it irritating. Uh, but he, he loved their war against Israel. He was completely lock, stock, and barrel uh, 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 drawn to and supportive of what they were doing uh, in terms of their, in terms of their, uh, their war project. Uh, now, that's not surprising, right? I mean, a guy, who, a guy, who, a guy like Durham is going to like the guys with the big guns. The thing that was surprising was that Hezbollah welcomed Durham's support. Now, this was different than uh, Islamic, Islamist ideologues that I had come to know across the region. I mean, the, uh, Hezbollah takes its ideology seriously, but it turns out they are completely, completely uh, open to support from people like Durham who haven't signed on to their religious project, who haven't signed on to all their, uh, you know, their, their morality, their belief system, so long as they don't pose a threat and don't oppose them. So Durham willing to support Hezbollah's war effort is not going to challenge anything else that's important to them. They're happy to have it. Uh, and that is really their secret to success, right? They have this, uh, they have this very potent ideology. Uh, at its base, it's, it's, it's a, it's a two-point two point view of the world. One is holistic Islam, an Islam that teaches you how to be a better person, a more prosperous person, uh, an empowered, successful person. And two, perpetual war, uh, which mobilizes you. So it, 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 it raises this uh, creed from just being you know, a sort of Islamic megachurch into something that's much more dynamic and, and potent. Uh, and it's, just, it's a two-step dance, and it, and it, and it keeps... You know, it feeds on itself. Uh, the, the, the more successful the society is, the more successful it is at fighting its wars and rebounding from them, uh, the more those wars imbue it with meaning and a sense of destiny. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and these two, these two uh, currents enrich each other, uh, and uh, they take uh, men like Durham uh, and, 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 and sort of welcome their initial sliver of support and then imbue it with something deeper. And, and, and what's really interesting to see work is how Hezbollah takes a guy like Durham. Uh, they, uh, they take him seriously and they send people every week to talk to him about religion, about faith, give him a little Islamic education, a little skills education, a little uh, uh, sense of trying to part a little sense of self-worth, trying to get him to clean up his life and, and, and sort of get, his, get, his, get himself together. Over time, I mean, over the, the five years I've known Bergam, he has become more religious. Uh, he has started to buy into Hezbollah's political narrative, and he started to pay attention to what the party says about these kinds of... Uh, uh, political matters that he mocked five years earlier. Uh, that is a huge part of the recipe for success. Uh, so, the, uh, the, a, a, and what is the worldview that, that they have so successfully imparted? Uh, not just in Lebanon, but around the Arab world. Uh, I, I, I think their own description of it is the most compelling. It's a society of Islamic resistance, and mind you, Islamic is interpreted ecumenically. They welcome the support of Christians. They welcome the support of non-Muslims. Their biggest uh, supporter inside Lebanon is a Christian party, a nationalist Christian party led by Michel Laoun. Uh, uh, they are non-denominational Islamists. Uh, and, and what they've done is they have created an idea 
of empowered indigenous resistance. Uh, and the ethos of resistance is one that, that, that addresses a lot of ideological needs at once. It addresses the need for how to, how to take a stand against Israel. It addresses the stand for how to, uh, how to motivate people to take control of their own lives and, and try and build a society rather than survive in the sort of wreckage of a state uh, that characterizes so many countries in the Arab world. Uh, and, uh, and they have really uh, managed over nearly three decades now to refine that message, pulling in strands of, 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 uh, of Arab nationalism, <coughs> strands of communism, strands of just regular militancy, uh, and then uh, uh, fundamental ideas of faith that appeal to all the, the faith communities uh, in the Arab world. Uh, and, and they've packaged this in, in uh, an institution that has been incredibly successful. So in a region of failure, in a region where there's a vacuum of leadership, a vacuum of achievement, uh, Hezbollah stands out uh, head and shoulders above, above the rest. Uh, they've been the only Arab armed, armed force, army, if you want to call them an army, to successfully stand up to Israel. Uh, and they uh, kicked Israel out of southern Lebanon. They fought an 18 year guerrilla war, and Israel withdrew from its occupation zone in south Lebanon. Uh, they uh, won a war with Israel in 2006. They've rebounded to be stronger than they were before. Uh, and they have positioned themselves as the ideological alternative to what I call an axis of accommodation, the sort of sclerotic, uh, ideologically bankrupt regimes that. that ruled until recently in, in, in Egypt and Tunisia, and then still rule in places like Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, uh, and uh, the Palestinian Authority, and, and on and on. Uh, we have these, 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 these governments that stand for nothing but the perpetuation of their own power and really don't have a governing compact with their own people. Hezbollah has brilliantly uh, articulated an alternative to that that can appeal across national boundaries and across sectarian boundaries. That's why Hassan Nasrallah con consistently, for many years now, ranks as the most popular leader in the entire Arab world. He's a Shia militant who leads a, a, a essentially tiny uh, uh, Islamist party in a tiny nation, uh, and yet he is cho he's chosen by the, the Sunni public in Egypt by overwhelming uh, numbers as the most dynamic and popular leader. Why is that? Uh, and, and to my to my mind, there's there's two reasons. One is uh, is simply the act of having an, of articulating an alternative uh, uh, to the, the sort of failed uh, ideologies of, of the region. And secondly, because people find this idea of resistance incredibly empowering, uh, and it, and, it, and it's a, it's a, it's a it's a sort of attractive uh, and and um, energizing creed, and it's worked. Okay, Hezbollah used this ideology to move from the fringes of power to full domination and control of Lebanese politics, and they've used it to create a military uh, that, that is probably the most potent one in the Arab world, and they've done it with, with a very small amount of, uh, a, a small amount of money and weapons and, and, and people. Uh, so that's a really a, a winning model. Now, it's become a lot more interesting in the last few months, because uh, until until January, I would say this was the war of ideas: resistance, accommodation. Those are the two the two poles of, of of debate in the Arab world. And, and given how, uh, how how corrupt and ineffectual the, the forces of accommodation have been, they really did not present an, an, an attractive alternative. Uh, now suddenly we have a, a, an incredibly uh, dynamic alternative that's coming from a different part of, of, of the spectrum, and that's uh, the revolutionaries. Uh, I'm, I'm most interested in the revolutionaries in Egypt because Egypt has always been a trendsetter uh, in the Arab world and a, and a really important exporter of, of ideas and ideologies. The revolutionaries in Egypt are articulating uh, a worldview and a set of ideas that is equally uh, authentic indigenous uh, and empowering and does not come with the baggage of being Islamist uh, and, and uh, 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 driven by an idea of resistance. Uh, and that, I'm hoping that, uh, that the, the sort of central ideas of the 
youth movement that, that created this uh, revolution in Egypt, I'm hoping their ideas really calcify and, and uh, gain momentum so that they can join in, in a war of ideas against uh, uh, Hezbollah's sort of regional axis of, of, of resistance. Uh, now, you know, if you take a step back, you see Hezbollah's in a great position uh, to capitalize on what's happened in Egypt because they've been in favor of the opposition to Mubarak from the get-go. I mean, Nasrallah has been railing against Mubarak's cronyism and corruption and, and, and rampant torture for years and years. Uh, so they're already on the right side, and you know the United States was on the wrong side until the last minute. Uh, so in some ways, the, the resistance uh, movement, uh, as led, led by Hezbollah, is in a really uh, good place uh, to, to sort of link up with and capitalize on, on revolutionary uh, fervor that's sweeping through the Arab world. But those revolutionaries, uh, as far as I saw in, in my, my uh, uh, 10 days in Egypt just now, are not really interested in that revolutionary, uh, in, that, in that resistance idea. They have their own, uh, their own aspirations for a non-religious, non-militant, uh, but dynamic and, and um, constructive new era politics. And, and it's not necessarily going to be a politics that America likes, uh, but it is going to be uh, uh, if they, if one-tenth of what they want really materializes, it's going to be something that's going to be a whole lot better uh, uh, for, for, for the region and for U.S. interests than, um, than the, uh, the world view espoused by uh, Hezbollah. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the night that um, Mubarak quit, I was in Tahrir Square, and I was with two uh, young uh, members of the Muslim Brotherhood, and these are these are kids. One of them is 20. His name uh, 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 was Abdul Rahman. The other guy, 29. His name's Moaz. Uh, these are these are kids who grew up in the Brotherhood. Their parents were in the Brotherhood, uh, and uh, as youth activists in the, in, in the in the Brotherhood, they became disenchanted with how sclerotic and conservative their own leadership were uh, was, and they eventually more or less broke with uh, the Muslim Brotherhood organizationally and joined with the secular uh, youth activists who, who, who planned uh, the, these marches in January. Uh, eventually, their, their leaders joined on with them uh, when they saw how big it was getting. Uh, but these kids, on, on, uh, when Mubarak quit, they weren't uh, back in the, in the corner of the square where all the old guys with beers were. They were over in the middle of the square where all the young people were. Uh, uh, one of them has no beard, the other guy's got a short beard. Uh, they were uh, sharing this moment euphorically with, uh, with women and men uh, who, who had sort of sworn a joint allegiance to radically reforming the Egyptian system in, in a direction for which there was no template. Uh, and, and at the moment that this news came, uh, Abdul Karim turned to me and said, uh, I mean, Abdul Rahman, excuse me, turned to me and said, uh, he said, uh, he, he, quoting the old slogan of the Brotherhood, Islam is the solution, he said, what a stupid slogan. That slogan was never a good idea. Uh, and uh, and he's, he's all hot to trot to, uh, to see people like him who come out of the Islamic current uh, form a, a secular political party and compete, uh, compete in the marketplace of ideas in a, in a secular nationalist political system based on a constitution that's written with Arab-Egyptian values uh, uh, democracy as they conceive it, not as, as, as we've, we've tried to uh, uh, teach it to them in our USAID workshops. Uh, and uh, I think they have a good shot at success. And even if they don't, even if they don't make it, okay, even if they don't get to invent the new Egypt, uh, their, their political power, as evinced by what, what just happened with, with them forcing Mubarak to leave, and the ideas that they have so articulately put forward uh, in the last three weeks are forever going to change Arab politics. I mean, they have uh, they have written a new uh, a new script, uh, and uh, and it's going to be part of uh, part of what happens in the next 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, it's going to be who and what adopts the banner of these revolutionaries and uses it. Uh, to really invent a new era of politics uh, that can compete uh, effectively with the existing uh, 
uh, movement that's, that's signed on to Hezbollah's wider uh, resistance project. So uh, I'm optimistic. Uh, I'm optimistic because the, you know, the old order was not sustainable. I think it's going to be an uncomfortable time for the United States and it's going to be an uncomfortable time for Israel. Uh, both governments are going to have to deal with movements uh, and governments that don't, uh, don't talk the way we like people in the region there to talk. Uh, and, and we're going to have to get used to it. We're going to have to get used to allies that support some of America's strategic aims uh, but do so in a context of a not of unquestioning loyalty uh, to American interests or, or Israeli uh, red lines. And there's going to be a new language, a new language of politics, uh, and it's going to require a new language of foreign policy. I'm excited to watch it unfold. Uh, don't listen to anyone who gives you any authoritative predictions about what might happen, because no one, no one predicted this. No one knows where it's going to lead. Uh, we, have, we, we have a lot of information to help us figure out where it might go or what the alternatives are, uh, but it's a sort of fantastic uncharted new territory, and um, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's all going to be great, but it's all going to be very interesting. So with that, I'll take your questions, and uh, thanks for your patience.